This video will provide a conceptual overview of the flexibility method. The intent is to introduce the idea behind the method. This method is also known as the force method, as well as the method of consistent deformations, and we'll see why that is as we go through the example. Let's switch to pencil and paper. Here I have the example that we'll be looking at. It's a propped cantilever beam, fixed support at one end, roller at the other end, the ends are called A and B, cross-sectional properties EI, uniform load W over the full length of the beam, length L. We'll start by determining the degree of indeterminacy using our equation for NOS. NOS is three times the number of elements plus the number of reactions minus three times the number of nodes minus the number of hinges or other releases. NOS stands for the number of static unknowns. We have three times one element plus four reactions. That's three at the fixed end, one at the roller. Two nodes, one at A, one at B, and no hinges or other releases. This gives us a degree of indeterminacy of one. We can draw our primary structure, which is the original structure, with enough releases or enough supports removed to render it statically determinate. In this case, I've chosen to remove the roller at B. If I remove the roller at B, that gives me simply a cantilever beam, which we know to be statically determinate. I've also shown the force that the roller applies. I'm calling it R sub B for the reaction at B. And we'll see shortly how we use this force. Before doing that, I'll look at what the applied load does to the primary structure, to the cantilever. Here I'm showing the fixed end, the undeformed straight shape, the load applied, and then the curved deformed shape. And there's a value of deflection at the end, which I'm calling delta sub APP, for the applied load. And in the second diagram, I'm looking to see what this force R sub B does to the primary structure. I'm calling this force a corrective force. Some people call it a redundant as well. And the reason that it's a corrective force is that over here, the applied load has caused a deflection. This deflection shouldn't be there. In reality, there's a roller there. So I need to do something to the primary structure to cause this point going back up. I need to correct the error that was introduced by removing the roller. And it's this force right here that will correct that error. R sub B pushes up by a certain amount that I'm calling delta sub C O R R for a corrective deflection. The key constraint in the flexibility method is that these two values, delta applied and delta corrective, must be the same to enforce the same boundary condition that's applied by the roller. In other words, zero deflection at the tip. So the main task in the flexibility method is to enforce deformations that are consistent with the boundary conditions of the indeterminate structure. That's why sometimes this method is called the method of consistent deformations. Mathematically, as I stated in words before, this condition means that delta applied has to be equal to delta corrective so that the total value of deflection at the tip is zero and is consistent with the roller boundary condition. Incidentally, another name for this method is the force method. And the reason that it's called the force method is because this value of R sub B is unknown. Now pause the video. Take a minute and think of all the different methods that you know of to calculate the deflection at the end of a cantilever due to a uniform load and due to the load at a tip. There are many different methods. We will be using virtual work quite a bit when we use the flexibility method. Throughout your previous courses, you learned about deflections by integration, perhaps the moment area method, the conjugate beam method, depending on where you studied. However, 
if at all possible, we want to avoid doing work. And to do that, we're going to use tables of member displacements. This is the appendix that's provided for you in the course materials. And we'll flip to the appropriate page. First, for the applied load, a uniform load on a cantilever beam, we're interested in this deflection here, F1. And F1 is given as QL to the fourth over ADI. In our case, the load is W. The length is a capital L, so we'll account for that. And we will write that this is equal to W L to the fourth over ADI. Now we're interested in the second deflection, a cantilever beam with a point load. And that one's found over here. Here's a cantilever beam point load P, the deflection at the location of the point load is what we're interested in. This particular table allows the point load to not be at the end of the beam, but L is given at the location of the point load. The deflection F1 is PL cubed over 3EI. So we'll write then the force P is R sub B, L cubed over 3EI. As previously stated, the unknown value is the force, the redundant force. So we need to solve this algebraically for R sub B. The EIs cancel, three of these Ls cancel three of those. That leaves us W L over there. And that the three comes up, the eight's here. So I get three W L over eight. If that's not clear to you, pause the video, work on the algebra. That's the new part of the method. After this, we're going to use statics to find the rest of the information. What I'm showing here is a free body diagram that represents the quantities that we know so far and what we have yet to determine. We know the distributed load W. We now know this force at the right side, 3WL over 8. I just calculated it by going through this whole process but I still need to find the moment at the end and the vertical reaction. Well, this is a pretty straightforward problem from statics. I can sum forces in the vertical direction, and this will tell me that R sub A is equal to W times L, the total force from this distributed load, minus 3 WL over 8, that's equal to 5WL over 8. I can sum moments about end A, and that would tell me that M sub A is equal to the resultant of this force, WL, times the location of that resultant, midway, minus the moment due to this force, 3WL over 8, times the moment arm, this moment is equal to W L squared over 8. So now I have a fully solved free body diagram. If I wanted to, I could draw a shear diagram. I could draw a bending moment diagram or answer any other question that I wanted to. But any of that is using methods that you already know from statics, from analysis of determinate structures. The new parts of this method are upstream. Let's review them one more time before we finish. First, we determine the degree of indeterminacy. We make sufficient cuts or remove a sufficient number of reactions from the indeterminate structure to render it determinate. We call that the primary structure. On the primary structure, we indicate the redundant force or forces that have to be there because we removed something. In this case, we removed a support. We removed a roller. We find the deflection wherever we've removed a support due to the applied load. We find a similar deflection due to the corrective or redundant force. We enforce the condition that those must be the same to enforce the actual boundary condition in the indeterminate structure. And then we can actually put values into it. So 
we find the deflections in this case from the table, if that's possible. Solve for the unknown force. And then once we have the unknown force, we go back to previous methods for determinate structures. We apply those to find any other quantity that we're interested in. This ends the conceptual introduction to the flexibility method. In subsequent videos, we'll see how to do this same problem with a different primary structure, and then we'll formalize our notation and see how we can apply this method to structures with a higher degree of indeterminacy.